come on in, pull up a chair and take a load off because today I'll be sharing a bit of a how to play as well as my review of Battle of the Bulge 1944 from Worthington Publishing. Is this a quick playing lightweight war game perfect for introducing the hobby to non war gamers? Or is this simply yet another disposable bulge game? in a sea of disposable bulge games. Well, you're going to find out right after this. Howdy, 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 gang. Welcome once again to the Duck Ape Studios. I'm Jeff McAleer, your host here at the Gaming Gang channel. As I mentioned in the open, I am going to be reviewing Battle of the Bulge 1944 from Worthington Publishing. It's designed by Dan Forney with artwork provided by Sean Cook. This is for one or two players. I will discuss that during the review. It is for ages 14 and up. Plays in around two hours, depending on the scenario. And it is available right now for an MSRP of $70. So let's swing on over to the other camera because I've got Battle of the Bulge 1944 set up. So before we dive in, I do want to mention that the fine folks over at Worthington Publishing were kind enough to send me this review copy. But neither I nor anyone else affiliated with the gaming gang has received any other sort of compensation for me to share my thoughts about this game with you. These days, it's important that you know that. All right, that said, we're going to dive in. I already did an unboxing live on the gaming gang dispatch. So if you want to see a bit closer look at some of the components and things like that, by all means, check that video out i will uh, include a link in the uh, show notes area so this is a good size board pretty good size board here and uh, covers a good area as well so it's not just all right around just best stone so let's tour around the board a little bit because just about everything you need to play the game is on the game board so we have our terrain chart. It's going to tell us what uh, is the cost to move units into terrain, as well as what kind of combat effects will that terrain have, both as attackers and defenders. We have a breakdown of the units themselves, how to read the counters. I will discuss that in a bit. We'll zoom in. We'll get a, we'll get a better look at the counters as well. We've got out of supply effects. We've got our resource point chart because that's how we activate units to move and to fight. We also have a track. Now, you can't see it because I'm picture in picture up here. It's cutting off a little bit of the resource point track for the Germans. But for the Allies, we've got it right down here. We also have our Allied turn track and our German turn track as well. Germans go first each turn. Uh, depending on the scenario, and there are variable scenarios. We'll take a look at those cards in a sec. So you could be playing the full 10 turn game, or you could be shorter than that. So, and of course, you can actually choose to go shorter than that as well if you're a little pressed for time and you want to get the game in quickly. The game box does indicate that this takes about two hours to play, and... I got to be honest, that's right on the money. I mean, it really is. So let's take a look here. We got the rule books. We get two of them. We're only, you know, they're identical, which I like how Worthington does that because then you can give a rule book to a friend that you're going to be playing this with and uh, at least give them a, a leg up on learning the game. I got to be honest, 15, 20 minutes is probably all it's going to take for you to understand how to play Battle of the Bulge 1944. So there's we've got some examples in here as well. Grand total, we've got all of really like seven pages of rules. 
This is part of the Hold Fast series, or it uses the Hold Fast system from Worthington. I have not played any of those games with that those mechanics prior to this. So kind of cool, kind of interesting. Want to point out this is a game that is very lightweight. It is low complexity, and it it is certainly not going to appeal to the groiners out there who are like, oh my gosh. I need to simulate every single sort of unit that would have been on the battlefield. That is not, that is not the case. All right. So we do get some examples on the back as well. Tell you what, let's zoom on in now that you've kind of seen everything that's outlying the actual map of the game. I'm going to zoom in quite a bit. Give that a second here. There we go. That should be nice and focused. So we have some various different alternate objectives for the Germans. And I thought this was very interesting. I like this quite a bit because you may not want to just continually rehash the same thing over and over again. So this is basically talking about what do the Germans need to succeed? How many turns is it going to take? We've got our sudden death victory conditions that if the German player can achieve these, uh, the game ends immediately. So we've got those here. We've got four of them. Spoiling attack. So some of them are rather short. And then this is our historical operation as well. So there are four cards. And if you'd like... You could actually shuffle these up and take one at random and uh, work from there with it. So pretty cool. So I like the uh, the art style on the map. I think it's pretty cool. There's one, one thing that kind of sticks out to me, though. Well, two things, honestly. First of all, this rough terrain here, this olive green, is very, very similar in color to the allied units. So at a distance, it can kind of get a little lost in that. It's not too bad, but I would have liked to have seen, even though it might've looked kind of sillier, but uh, maybe going with a brown or an evergreen or something, something that's just a lot more dissimilar than the olive drab that we have for the U.S., because we do have some British troops, which that stands out much better. So we've got that. So I do like that. Also, uh, we see the hex numbers are not easy to make out. And we have these cool order of battle cards, which are essentially just going to take your counters. You're going to stack them up. And we've got our reinforcements here as well. And if you flip this over, it'll show you the placement of your units. Once again, it's a little tough to make out <laughs> to uh, to make out the uh, the counter. Or I should say hex numbers here as well. But I mean, it's not a huge thing. But I, I do want to point it out. It can be a little tough. And uh, my vision is at halfway decent. I mean, I do wear contacts. And, of course, uh, uh, the contacts I wear are actually for, like, reading. Instead of wearing reading glasses, they're almost, I don't want to say they're bifocal contacts, but they're kind of like that. <laughs> so, anyway, that's why a lot of times I'm sitting here you know, doing a, an unboxing or we're doing a, a page through, say, of a role-playing game product. Thankfully, I can read. <laughs> I can actually read the pages from here. So that's a German order of battle. Then we have the Allied order of battle as well. So very cool. Like I said, I really like these. Uh, and all you got to do is put them right to the side of of your game board here for each of the players. And you're good to go. You really are. We also have a game pad. I, I got to be honest. Well, I don't know why we really have the score pad here. 
I guess if you want to track each time you play, that's cool. I mean, that's fine. All right. Let me try to zoom in just a little bit more. There we go. So that's that's as close as we're going to get. So I'm going to show you the units. So, and I'm going to actually put them there so they kind of stand out a little bit. All right. So that uh, we've got uh, infantry there and we've got armor here. So taking a look at these counters, you think, oh, I, especially if you're familiar with wargaming, you're thinking, oh, there we go. It's our typical attack combat factor, defensive combat factor, and movement. Well, you'd be kind of right. First off, you're not going to have those stacked. You're going to have them just like this. You're going to keep these on your order of battle board because the game has step reduction. So as opposed to just removing a counter when it's destroyed or just flipping it over and then it gets one more hit and it's gone, we're going to see that we've got different levels of steps. So for an example here, we've got this uh, Panzer unit and it shows that we've got four of four. So this is the full strength counter. Now, if it takes an armor hit, you're going to flip it over. So we see it's three of four. If it were to take yet another hit, you're going to replace it with a two of four. And then that the right one yep one of four i was gonna say <laughs> double check and make sure i had the right one there and then of course if that step is reduced then that unit is removed so but to start off you'd be just like that so of course we've got infantry here as well so we have some custom dice right there so there are 10 custom dice that come with battle of the bulge 1944 that is a hit on the infantry. This is a hit on armor. So if you are attacking and there is infantry and armor in the defensive hex that you're attacking, then that's going to reduce your armor unit one step. This would reduce the infantry one step so it is possible that uh you roll all infantry hits and you're attacking armor well oh well nothing you would get nothing so on the counters this is representing the number of dice you're going to roll in combat so that is three of these dice four of the combat dice Cool thing, too, is the attacker and defenders both roll dice at the same time. If you've got enough dice for both of them to be rolling at the same time. Otherwise, attacker rolls, then the defender takes the dice they need, and then they roll. So I like that aspect as well. So I like this because this is something that's going to appeal to non-war gamers. They're going to see these dice, and they're going to go, oh, hey, it's not just a regular six-sided die. These look a little bit different. Do you want to mention though that these are screened? So they actually they're not cut. These dice are not cut. Uh there's actually a bit of a raised surface on this. So I'm not sure how long these dice will hold up in play. They should be fine. I mean, worst comes to worst. You got one armor, you got one infantry. You can roll regular six-sided dice. A five is infantry, a six is armor or vice versa, whatever, however you want to do it. But I do like this. I think that's pretty cool. So the second number, that is our, essentially the number of steps that are in this unit, even as it's being reduced. So as an example here, we see that this is one of three and it shows the one. So that's all that's telling us. Funny thing is, if that takes the hit, you can flip it over. It's eliminated. So 
that be it's because it has three steps, not four. So this is the the one step left, and then poof, gone. All right. Then we got movement. The number of movement points that that will have. So what you'll do is each turn, and as I mentioned, Germans will go first. Let's grab some. Just for the heck of it, let's, let's do this. And we'll do that. So the Germans will go first, and they're going to use their uh, their resource points. So they can use resource points to refit, which is essentially to rebuild lost steps, or they can use their resource points to move units, basically activating to move units and attack it. So the Germans will start off with, with a lot of resource points. In the first turn, they've got 20, whereas the Allies only have six. Now that's going to begin to change. The, the worm will turn. So the German player will have fewer and fewer resource points, although they never get, like, way down. I mean, they'll go down to 16, whereas the Allies will start gaining momentum and they will start gaining resource points until they'll reach 18 on a turn. We have different weather as well uh, that is already marked on each turn. There are some rules for variable weather if you'd like to do that as well. All right, so what the German player could do here is they would activate. So they would spend one to activate and move. Now, normally, you're just going to pay for out of your movement points out of what the terrain says. So, right, so on a road, you're going to move much further with your four movement points than you would moving through rough terrain. Now, this game does have zone of control, so it costs three to move into another unit's zone of control. Doesn't matter what the terrain is does not matter at all. So if I did something like that, I would spend my one resource point to activate and move, spend another resource point, activate and move. And you can do all this stuff in any order that you'd like. So you can have breakthroughs and then race units through breakthroughs. And it, it doesn't matter if it's you know, allies or Germans. The allies can do a little blitzkrieg themselves. So in, in essence, when you're doing an attack, what you're going to do is you pay one resource point if the units are part of the same army or corps. So here we see, yes, yes, they both belong. So it's only going to cost us one to make an attack. If they were different, and, of course, I don't have one that's different sitting out here. <laughs> we'll point out these are nice, chunky counters, too. Uh, you would actually be paying the extra uh, resource point for the combined attack. So this would give me seven, seven dice. And I would roll, let's say that's our defender there. That's the hex we're attacking. And out of all of that... I get three hits. I'm going to say, well, wait a second, Jeff. That's armor. Those, those are armor hits. Well, if there's no armor present, then that counts as infantry hits. So that would be three hits, and this would be reduced all the way down to one step. Just like so. Now, remember, we had three dice here. So we're going to, we would be rolling at the same time, but so this would be the counterattack. Oh, actually, I should have pointed out attacking into a town and you're looking at the terrain there was forest. So we would actually have subtracted a die from each of those on the attack. So instead of rolling seven dice, I should have been rolling five. So one of the cool things is if you're defending in a town, 
you'll actually gain a die. So we went, remember, we had three here. We would have four. And we would have had one hit on the infantry, just like so. That's combat. I mean, that's that's essentially combat. Uh, there are rules for supply. The supply rules are pretty easy. Uh, you just have to be able to trace a, a line to a supplied road or a supplied um, board edge. It is pretty easy to cut off supply because you cannot, obviously enough, trace a line of supply through a zone of control of the enemy. So one of the big aspects of this game as well is making sure that you're you're cutting off supply to units because if they are out of supply they're going to lose attack dice and they're going to lose movement points from those out of supply units as well so I do want to show you we've got a cool little counter tray got all different counters we've got some informational markers there as well but let's kind of try to get a little better light on those. But once again, as I pointed out, this is this is a fairly lightweight war game. This is this makes for a really nice gateway war game, especially if you know somebody. And I know a lot of a lot of times people are looking at ways to introduce war games to younger gamers. So if somebody has any kind of interest in World War II, this is Definitely something that you'll want to take a peek at. Of course, we do have our victory conditions. So we have some of these towns. We'll have uh, zoom back out so I can show you. Oh, come on. My gosh. There we go. I'm trying, trying to show you at least here. So we've got a variety of different uh, towns that are worth victory points. So we have, like, for an example right here, Best Known. So what you'll end up doing, like I said, we do have some sudden death victory conditions for the Germans, depending on the scenario. If we get to the end of the number of turns that we're playing in that scenario and the Germans have not achieved those, then what you're going to do is you're going to count up the number of towns with victory points that the German player controls. And then there is a chart for you to take a peek at. And it'll tell you if the Germans have a victory, is, if, is, it, is it a draw or is it a German defeat? And that in essence really is everything to Battle of the Bolts, 1944. So let's swing on over to the other camera and I will provide some final thoughts as well as my review score. So this is the first time I, I've played any of the Hold Fast series or mechanics from Worthington. I think this is a pretty good game. Uh, it is, it's not super heavy. I'm going to tell you right off the bat, it is not going to appeal to like diehard war gamers out there unless they're looking for something that's fairly light I mean, there's there's a bit of meat on the bones with supply rules and 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 variable weather, and you've got uh, like leaders that can be added to a unit that give you an extra die, and you've got artillery, and you've got you've got air power, especially for the allies that they can utilize and decide when do they want to break that out for the turn. So you've got a variety of of different things, but once again, this is not simulating every system that was in use on the battlefield during the Battle of the Bulge. It is a gateway game, in my opinion, or something that uh, is just, just designed to be played in a couple of hours, give you a good feel, and then move on. I got to say, there's a lot of things that I really like about this. I've kind of covered those as I talked about uh, things in the review. A couple of things I'm not so keen on. For one, because this is, in my opinion, and I would have to say 
I would take a guess in Dan Forney, the designer's opinion, this is an introductory game. This is a low-complexity war game. I'm kind of surprised they went with the NATO iconography because we have seen other games from Worthington that do utilize, you know, little images of tanks and troops and, and things like that. I would have thought just to have a little more visual pizzazz that maybe that would have been something that Worthington would do because once again, it is an introductory war game and we are always looking for ways to bring non-war gamers into the hobby. We've got the various different dice, the custom dice that kind of stand out and people go, huh, what's that? As opposed to, ah, oh, I just, just rolling those six sided dice and we're looking at our combat results table and let's see you figure out the odds here. It was two to one. So there's none of that. So I, I, I dig that. I wish we would, would have different iconography on the counters themselves. Did mention uh, that the dice have a kind of upraised surface to them. Might see some wear and tear on those with uh, the white peeling off or just kind of getting scratched off. I don't know. I haven't played this a ton to know. But those are kind of my, like, quibbles with the game. Uh, also, you know, the, uh, let me grab it, the rough terrain being very, very similar in color to the olive drab of the U.S. troops is a little odd, as well as the uh, hex numbers being a little difficult to make out. Could have been a little bit bigger, a little bigger font would have helped us, especially uh, <laughs> those older war gamers out there who uh, might have a little bit of a hard time, you know, without reading glasses. There's a lot to really dig about the game. Like I said, it's about two hours to play it. It says it's for one or two players. I got to be honest. I don't really see this as a solitaire game. In fact, even on the box, the solitaire suitability is, is pretty low. So I'm not sure why it's being marketed as one or two players. It really is a two player game. If you're looking for something that is lightweight and a good way to bring some non-war gamers into some war gaming, then I definitely really do like Battle of the Bulge 1944. Lastly, I got to ding it, and I hate having to do this with the Worthington Publishing titles, but I've been doing this more with, with other war game companies as well. The MSRP is a little high. I I think you're getting a, a good game, but I do think the MSRP is just a, $70 feels a little high. And yes, I know it. I say it all the time. Wargaming is a niche of a niche hobby. And wargaming companies tend to have to charge a little bit more because they got to stick around. I get it. I, I totally understand. $70, I think think is just a touch high gang so i'm gonna ding the score a half point all in all i really do like battle of the bulge 1944 i certainly recommend it and i give it a score on a scale of one to ten and eight out of ten i enjoyed it that much we had fun with it and once again i think it's a perfect game to break out for those of you who are looking to expose non-war gamers to our hobby. I think it's pretty cool. Very nicely done. All right. That is it for this time out. If you like this video, by all means, please give it a quick thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And if you do subscribe, ding that bell. It'll not only let you know when I upload videos such as this review, it'll also inform you when my live stream, The Gaming Gang Dispatch, airs Monday through Thursday nights right here on YouTube as I bring you the latest in tabletop gaming news and first looks at role-playing games, war games, board games, miniatures rules. Every night we're looking at something new. And of course, when you're not watching videos on the Gaming Gang channel, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com for all the latest in gaming news, reviews, and a whole lot more. You know the drill. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. 
course, once again, I'm Jeff McLear. Thank you very much for watching. And as I wrap up all my videos during this never ending pandemic, certainly hope all of you out there are being smart and staying safe. Oh, hey, you're still here. Well, if that's the case, by all means, if you haven't subscribed to the Gaming Gang channel yet, click right here. If you'd like to see the latest episode of the Gaming Gang Dispatch, click right up there. And if you want to trust YouTube's algorithm to give you something to watch, click right there. Once again, thanks so much for watching, and everybody, please... Wear a mask.